Hello? Hi. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. <laughs> I was wondering what happened. The whole screen went black. Um, hello and welcome to Innovation Espresso. We've rebranded. Just kidding. Welcome to Innovation Coffee brought to you by R. My name is Robert Wolf and I'm your host today and every Thursday at 5 p.m. UTC. Cheers. Let me take a little sip here. And today do we have the episode or a very exciting episode for you. We are meeting with Martin Woolley, who is a senior developer relations manager for Bluetooth. Now, I know Bluetooth is a very commonly used word. I think probably 99% of the world has probably said that word. Um, but maybe people didn't know that there uh, is actually an organization that monitors and manages the Bluetooth protocol and all the things that go into making your devices connect together over this amazing and magical thing called Bluetooth. So Martin Woolley is joining us today to talk to us all about it. We're going to learn a little bit of a history about it. We're going to learn what's going on new in the world of Bluetooth. And then he has not one, not two, not three, not four, but five demos. So five demos is going to show us people on Twitter were going crazy about, uh, you know, how crazy that is because, um, you know, in this, uh, in this line of work, um, we make many sacrifices to the demo gods in order for one demo to work. So imagine how this is going to go when we have five demos. I'm excited to see all of them. I'm also excited to see the cool stuff that he has prepared for us. Now, as always, if you have questions throughout this stream, feel free to post them in the chat. We'll do our best to get to them in a timely manner. Of course, we're not going to just interrupt at the, in the middle of something. But um, if there is something that comes up, feel free to post that. Also, if you do enjoy this video, hit that thumbs up button. Helps us out a lot. And if you like watching these uh, videos in general or this series of innovation coffee and all the other cool stuff that arm has to offer subscribe to arm software dev this is the channel we're here doing all sorts of cool stuff for you pretty much on a on a daily basis i feel like videos are coming out and pinging me all the time so there's lots of cool stuff happening in the ecosystem and this is where you can catch it all all right there i think that's my summary i hope i covered it let's bring martin into the call it's time to time to meet him was I, I, oh my gosh you know what i just realized I was looking at the wrong camera. I have this camera on today. I was looking up at the camera that I thought was on. Darn it. Hi, Martin. How are you doing? Robert, hi. I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you. Really pleased to be here. Excellent. Welcome to Innovation Coffee. So happy to have you here. Thank and, you. Um, and uh, you know, tr true to fashion here, what we usually do at the very beginning, you know, we want to get to know you. Everyone already knows me. So um, maybe, Martin, you can spend a little bit of time, a minute or two, telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, sure. Um, I have some pictures to accompany this. Um, I'm British, as you can probably hear, and I'm based just outside London. Work for the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, uh, an organization I'll, uh, I guess, explain later on. Um, been with them almost eight years, in fact, now. Um, worked on with Bluetooth for uh, quite a long time, but with the SIG, as we call ourselves, for nearly eight years. Done lots of great things, really interesting things, I mean. I've also been with them. Um, one of which was working on the BBC Microbit with other companies like Arm uh, and Lancaster University and Microsoft. That was a bit of a highlight for me. Um, I've always worked in the world of software development in all sorts of roles, from developer to architect to engineering manager, and now doing what I do at the Bluetooth Special Interest Group. Um, outside the world of work, because I do have a life outside the world of work, more or less, um, I love bikes, uh, kind of really into cycling, um, big hills, occasionally mountains as well. I'm a complete masochist, basically. Um, love hiking and walking as well, like being outside. Uh, last year, I finished a 660-mile trail that follows the uh, the coast around southwest England with my wife and a couple of friends. That was an absolutely fantastic adventure. Uh, took us 57 days. Um, more like that planned, hopefully. Um, I also, I kind of like birds into birds yeah especially birds that come to my own small garden and I like photography so I kind of like taking pictures of the birds in my garden um, I've even learned all the names of the birds not not their individual names obviously that would be crazy but the species I can name the species quite proud of that um, this is a recent hobby if you like um, and last but not least you can probably tell from uh, what you see behind me uh, I'm into music and music production and what with being incredibly old and everything I have been for a really long time um, as evidenced by these two photographs, 
from 1981. So there's me as a teenager in my bedroom. Obviously, I've painted the walls black because I was a teenager and that's what you do. Uh, it's my first synthesizer and analog Roland SH09 that I still own. Uh, the amplifier there I built from uh, a kit soldering every component. First time I wow. ever used a soldering iron. I think my parents were slightly concerned. What's he doing? What's happening to our kitchen table? That kind of stuff. Um, but on the right, it gets more interesting because that's my first band playing our first gig. Um, I, I don't wish to sound boastful here, but I think we had in the audience easily six people. Big times, tell you. Um, but the band was called Syntax Error. And here we have a clue about my kind of origin when it comes to computing. And you can just about make out a black and white portable TV in the background there. That was part of our show because I had this thing plugged into it. I hope you can see that. That is my first computer. It's a Sinclair ZX81. It's got a Z80 processor in it. It has 1K of RAM. And I was teaching myself to program back then from a book, from magazines, stuff like that in basic and assembler. And I think I had it flashing the band's name on and off in really crude graphics, um, which went really well until someone tripped over the cable and unplugged it. They were obviously you know, dancing uncontrollably to our music and you know, stuff like that happens. But there you go. That's where I got into computers really back then. And that sort of set the, the sort of course um, for where we find ourselves today, about to talk about Bluetooth. Very nice, very nice. So, you know, Martin, that's awesome. I, 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 actually, I have, actually have to touch on a couple of these things. So, like, number one, micro bit. I mean, that was a game changer in in the, I want to say, at least educational industry. Um, yeah. It was huge. I mean, like, I, you know, in the not since COVID, but, you know, before COVID, going to conferences, you'd find these little micro bit uh, uh, booths where people could go up and test it out. You know, I remember sitting there and testing out the, uh, the SDK that they have, or the, um, sorry, IDE that you guys have for, uh, for basically just kind of putting in code and then pushing it to the micro bit, super easy, yeah. super fun, lighting up the LEDs, um, gets kids excited. I think that this, this, the, the, the after effects of something like the micro bit is going to probably echo throughout the next couple decades as we start to see more computer yeah. engineers come out of college because of something like this. I think it's huge. I think you're right. I think it was a, an inspired idea, which, of course, originated from the, the BBC, our uh, British Broadcasting Corporation, who also have a remit in their charter to do with education. So that's why it kind of came from there. And they pulled together um various companies they approached the bluetooth special interest group because the the device they wanted to have bluetooth and they needed some expertise so um it being a british project me being uh, here in britain um that's how i got involved and it, it was great yeah i really enjoyed uh, those days working with some really great people very nice very nice yeah so i mean thank you and, and kudos for that uh the next thing is bikes bicycles uh, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to buy one. My wife and I both want to buy one. So you might be hearing from me on the side, uh, getting some, sure. some advice from you there. Um, and then, gosh, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about, but maybe I forgot because I got too excited about the micro bit and the bicycle. Okay. That's okay though. We can continue going. And if I remember, I'll ask you later. Um, so, uh, we have a, a, a fun, even though your intro was a pretty nice icebreaker. I like that. You know, I think that people should start doing these little quick slideshows, uh, maybe more often when they do this little two minute intro, but, um, a little icebreaker round that we like to call innovation coffee crib. So let's cue that. So there you go. All right. I hope everyone else can hear that audio because I can't hear the audio for that. It usually has this cool little beat that goes on. Um, but so Martin, Innovation Coffee Cribs, kind of like our take on what's on your desk or MTV's Cribs. Um, and I noticed that, you know, as you mentioned, have this cool music stuff behind you. I'm guessing there's a bunch of cool stuff on your desk. Maybe you could just share one or two things that you have uh, that you're working on or things that you just have to touch yeah, on well, there. Most of the good stuff on my desk is actually in that camera view. I'll show you one other thing. Um, which isn't, which I kind of, um, I, I couldn't do without. It's this thing. It's actually um, a protocol analyzer. So this great big box with its antenna, a uh, very specialized bit of kit lets me uh, have a look at the protocol, the communication going on between devices and solve problems and stuff like that. Everything else that's on my desk, I've kind of collected into one space and stuck under this desk camera here so I can show you it. And I've got, um, I've got a micro bit here. 
I'm going to use in one of the demos later on. I've got an Android smartphone. Smartphone's pretty important in the world of Bluetooth. Um, I've got a Raspberry Pi here, Pi 4. Um, I've got, this is a developer board from Nordic Semiconductor, an NRF 52 something. Um, these things, these black things, these are also from Nordic. These are called the Nordic Thingy. Yes, Thingy. I think it's thingy. possibly the greatest product name ever. And I've always wanted to have been in the room when they kind of discussed whether or not they could really release a product called Thingy. But they, they were brave and they did it. I think it was an inspired choice. I mean, like, I could just... I could imagine them sitting in that conference room and just being like, hey, hand me that thingy over there real quick, you know? And then, <laughs> hey, we just call it that. Oh, it's, it's genius. <laughs> uh, I've got this thing. Um, I like to call it Dogbot. It's a, a kind of robot, but it isn't really. It's also uh, micro bit controlled. I'll show you Dogbot uh, in action. It's a kit. I kind of um, added things to. I'll explain that more later on. Um, I've got two mystery devices here from a company called U-Blocks, um, which oh, are... It's a demonstrator of a really interesting capability that Bluetooth has that I don't think many people know about. So I'm going to kind of hold that back and uh, do a big reveal uh, when I go uh, through my demos and uh, explain what those two uh, items are about. And that's it. I generally just have loads of Bluetooth bits and pieces all over the place. It's, it's not, not usually as tidy as this. I got, I just got a real quick question here. I'm wondering... Would you would you think or do you think that your house is more is smarter because you work and do all this stuff with Bluetooth? Like, is your house like decked out with all sorts of connected devices compared to someone else's? Um, honestly, I'm going to say no. It, it probably isn't um, for no particular <laughs> reason. I'm too mean to actually pay for stuff myself. You see, that's what it is. Gotcha. If you want to give me things, you know, I'm fine, but. Uh, but no, not particularly. I mean, you know, I have a, a moderately smart TV that has Bluetooth in it and um, and audio devices. I mean, uh, you know, we'll talk a bit more about the history of Bluetooth soon, I'm sure. But, um, you know, audio was the killer app. I haven't particularly gone down the smart home route yet. I've, um, I've talked at lots and lots of smart home, smart building conferences over the years and tended to take the line that I've always seen there being a more compelling business case in the commercial smart building world than in the res residential um, sector where there's less reason to have it but i think i was possibly wrong because uh, convenience seems to have won the day there you know people are buying smart speakers because they are uh, they like the convenience um and you know often bluetooth is supported by those devices but but no my my house is probably not um a showcase for um bluetooth smart building technology i'm afraid yeah, it's funny you say that. Actually, you know, like I'm I'm starting to put in a a surround sound for uh for my house, and we're mm -hmm. looking at doing this for obviously. I mean, I want to say music is nice to have, perfect for Bluetooth. But when you're talking about surround sound for a movie, you kind of need that. You need to be wired in at least if you have if you're Ooh. going to controversial from, controversial. controversial. But I was I was looking up I was looking up online and there were enough people saying that you need to be wired in and so that's why I kind of went with it but maybe you yeah. can convince me otherwise. Let's come back to that because Okay, come back to that. I want to tell you about the you know what's really going on at the moments shortly whenever you cue me up to do that and we'll that's, talk about audio that, state of That's the perfect. Art. I, I want to yeah. go through just a few chat messages here real quick. Someone has asked if we can share so so let's go from the top. First of all, um David says Love to hear some of Martin's tracks. I see that you have something in our document. Am I allowed to share that with people? Share that link, please. Oh. You'll see that. Um, so I've got a few albums. Um, albums. This is complete amateur stuff, right? I'm um, on YouTube, and I think my the number of views are possibly into double figures for some of the tracks there. So you know, we, we might be able to tip it over into triple figures. <laughs> awesome, awesome. There you go. Yeah. So um, there you are, David W. Um, now uh, Bruno up here. We did share that in the in the chat there. Bruno saying very interesting backstory. Martin, that's awesome. Yeah, I thought so as well. Thank Another you. one coming in from, I'm not going to try to say that name. I'll say your last name, Rakuba. Really interesting topic all the way from South Africa. Awesome. Dude, I love seeing people chime in from all over the world. That's amazing. Mm. Um, we got in information from saying the audio is okay. And then here from Sandeep, a question. So since you're showing all this hardware, what is your favorite dev board? Oh, I don't have a favorite board. I'm going to disappoint a lot of manufacturers there by saying that. Um, I seem to have quite a lot of stuff from Nordic lying around, but I've got stuff from other manufacturers as well. Uh, you'll have to trust me on that. Um, if I have a favorite at all, actually, it's more on the software side. Um, I really like, um, there's an open source OS called Zephyr. 
uh, which oh, yeah. came out of the, the Linux Foundation. And I'm a big fan of that. It's got amazing support for Bluetooth. It's got some really, really expert people behind it as well. I kind of like Linux as well, actually. I do a lot of stuff with Raspberry Pis. Actually, I've been running Linux at home for uh, oh, a long time, since the 90s, actually. I think I first installed Linux at home. Um, but yeah, Zeph is great for microcontroller-based um, devices that have Bluetooth. Excellent. All right, cool. Well, there you go, Sandeep. Sandeep actually uh, works with us here at ARM. So oh, cool. Oh, nice Sandeep. Um, yeah. Nice Sandeep. Yeah. I know him. <laughs> A TensorFlow aficionado, uh, uh, awardee, uh, trophy holder. Um, he's been doing a lot of stuff with TensorFlow. And by the way, I don't think I got to congratulate you, Sandeep. Congratulations on that. Um, all right. So now on to the topic of the day, Bluetooth, even though we've been talking about it, of course. Bluetooth, could you give us a little bit of a history lesson? I mean, like, I'm interested in hearing some of the basic stuff, some of the things that I could get on Wikipedia, but also maybe some little secret little tidbits about the history of Bluetooth, if you have any. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, first of all, I have to tell you, uh, some of the Wikipedia stuff on Bluetooth is really bad and I really want to get it fixed. But okay. that's, a, that's a job for another day. Um, but a bit of quick history lesson. I mean, Bluetooth has been around for uh, actually over 20 years now. I think uh, officially it first kind of materialized in the year 2000. Uh, I was actually at the very first uh, Bluetooth World Exhibition and Conference in Monte Carlo when this new thing came out. So I saw it um, you know, right back then in the early days, but it originally it was conceived of as a wireless technology that allowed data to be exchanged directly between two devices. So no other intermediate networking equipment, no hubs, no routers, no access points, that kind of thing. And what we saw Bluetooth back then adopted for originally were things like wireless mice, very simple devices. So talking directly to a computer, and things like hands-free kits for cars, which of course is an audio application. You can use your phone without actually holding your phone. And audio of course turned out to be very much the killer app for Bluetooth, especially in the early days. And again soon, as you'll hear when I get to the end of this uh, brief history lesson. So that was the first incarnation of Bluetooth. It was called Bluetooth Basic Rate. Then we made it a bit faster. That's Bluetooth enhanced data rates, just an improvement on the original. Around 10 years ago, though, a whole new flavor of Bluetooth was um, designed and kind of came out in the Bluetooth core specification. And that's Bluetooth low energy, which I think most developers know about. Um, the original design goals for Bluetooth low energy were to be as power efficient as possible. So devices could run off teeny tiny batteries, which would last for months and months or longer. Um, but it's more than that. It's a lot more versatile. Um, the old Bluetooth was all about these point to point topologies, two devices talking directly uh, to each other. Bluetooth low energy can do that as well. You can connect one device to another and they can have a, a communication session. But it also allows you to broadcast data and broadcasting means that one device can transmit data that can be concurrently received by a literally unlimited number of other devices that are simply passive and listening to the radio communication in the environment. So that's really powerful and gives rise to all sorts of new product types and all sorts of new capabilities, including audio, which I will wind forward to in a moment. The next thing that happened after Bluetooth Low Energy in this quick history is Bluetooth Mesh. So Bluetooth Mesh is a networking technology that lets you create potentially very large networks of smart devices. Tens of thousands of devices are, are uh, possible. Originally conceived of the smart buildings, so that's the uh, commercial smart building set to large office blocks, stuff like that, for controlling your lighting systems, your air conditioning, your uh, heating system, and so on. Sensors everywhere, driving automation. Um, a couple of years ago, we made it possible to um, use Bluetooth for direction finding. So you could determine very accurately the direction a transmitted signal was coming from and use that to determine the precise location to within a few centimeters of a device. That's very cool. That's location based services. Um, and probably the most uh, exciting thing that's going on right now that's not quite finished but has mostly been released because there are lots of moving parts to it. And that is a new generation of Bluetooth audio technology. It's called LE audio because it's based on Bluetooth low energy. 
you can do all the things you could do with the old Bluetooth audio, but the quality is better and it leverages that broadcast capability so that rather than it just being about smartphone music to your headphones, kind of one-to-one, -one, point to point streaming of music, you can do that, but you can also share your audio using broadcast. So you can do completely public broadcasts. You can use it for private broadcast as well, password protected broadcast as well. So LE Audio is going to find all sorts of new use cases. It will support things like surround sound with five speakers, for example, as well. You, know, you name it, that audio scenario should be supported by LE Audio and hearing aids as well, which don't really have a good standard for wireless um, communication. So that, that's the next big thing from, uh, from the world of Bluetooth and the Bluetooth special interest group. That is awesome. Um, I feel like uh, maybe I need to throw, when that's ready, I throw a party at my house where everyone puts on headphones and we basically Absolutely. all just jam out and da da dance party, a headphone dance party. Silent disco. Yeah, there you go. Silent Please disco. Silent disco. Yeah, it's going to happen. No question. So, so I, you know, I want to go back to kind of this history, right? How long have you been actually working, you know, on Bluetooth or for Bluetooth? Well, two different things that I mean, I first um, became aware of Bluetooth when it was a new thing. Um, I was CTO of a startup um, which worked in the sort of mobile um, area, kind of just before smartphones, really. And I'd heard of this thing called Bluetooth, so I started looking at it then. Wind forward to um, 13 or 14 years ago, I actually worked for BlackBerry before I joined the Bluetooth SIG. Um, and at BlackBerry, I, I started to specialize in wireless communications. Um, in particular, uh, NFC, so near full communications, did lots of stuff with mobile payments uh, systems and Bluetooth low energy. So not so much the old Bluetooth, which frankly, I don't even know that much about because I've always specialized in Bluetooth low energy. So that's about, that's probably about 13 years ago when I started to specialize in that way. And then I joined the Bluetooth SIG seven and a half years ago, just more than that. So I'm, I'm well into my eighth year with them now. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could imagine the people who were, yeah, I, I thought maybe you were there since like the beginning, beginning, the people who were there since the very beginning, they, they must've been like kind of those magicians or rock stars of the time. All of a sudden your phone is now wireless and yeah. you're, you're just like, Whoa, you did that. Like you worked on uh, that. That's <laughs> I think you're right. I mean, they were absolute visionaries in two respects, actually. I mean, on, on the one hand, you've got, um, you know, the technical side, the pure technical side. You know, let's make this wireless technology that can do this stuff that we haven't really been able to do before in such a convenient and easy way, perfect for all these consumer electronics pro pro products. But the other thing they did that uh, really ensured that Bluetooth took off was they turned it into a standards-based mm -hmm. technology, which is my cue to explain who the Bluetooth special interest group are, just in case people don't know. Yes. So we're a standards development organization and what that means is that we oversee the, the development of all of the technical specifications that define how bluetooth works all the protocols and procedures and so on and how it must be used in different types of product now the actual technical work to define those specifications involves uh, people who work for all sorts of different companies experts from all over industry come together to do this work under our kind of umbrella. Um, we also have a series of formal testing procedures so that devices um, can be certified. We call it qualified to um, kind of prove that they do meet uh, the requirements in our specifications. And the net of all this, of course, is that you can buy a product from manufacturer A, you can buy another suitable, you know, applicable product from manufacturer B, and they will work together because standardization like this gives you interoperability between products. So what could have been a niche, a kind of clever and cool technology from one or two companies, Ericsson, Intel, people like that were key right at the beginning, became this global kind of dominating technology because of standards. Everyone adopted it because everything works with everything. You know, you know enormous marketplace was created uh, as a result of that. And I, have, I haven't seen the numbers for a long time, actually, and way out of date, but I mean, three, four years ago, there was something like 10 million devices every day shipping with Bluetooth in them. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's huge. St standards is a big thing, right? I mean, this was addressed during ARM Dev Summit. Um, it, 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 if you design your hardware for the code, 
it's a little more different. Uh, or, 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 I'm going to butcher the quote. One of the one of the keynotes, one of the keynote speakers just put it so perfectly, and why standards are so important. I'm not going to try to quote it, but basically, the 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 more standard the hardware, the 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 less difficult the code. And and I mean, I I feel like that's kind of the gist of it. But as you start developing these standards around everything. Um, you know, it's it's just a more welcoming experience and, of course, makes it yeah. easier for people to develop. I mean, it's just standards make it easier for people yeah. to develop. It's good for developers. It's yes. good for the end users as well, I think. Yeah. Mm. So uh, let's get some questions out of the way. We're at about the 30 minute mark and I want to make sure you have enough time for your demos. So right. um, let me get these questions here uh, and some comments. So one is Bruno's asking, I want to know where that color came from. I think you're talking about the Bluetooth color, the color of the Bluetooth logo, maybe. Um, oh, no idea. It's very yeah. pretty, isn't it? I like it. It's nice blue. Don't know. Yeah, they definitely nailed it. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go with Tyeth here. So Tyeth is asking, do later Bluetooth specs include ultra wideband like Apple, Samsung, UWB tag support? They do not. Uh, UWB is not a Bluetooth technology. Um, we have our own direction finding uh, capability in Bluetooth 5. Excellent. Excellent. Throughout your speech there, you blew Sandeep's mind. Um, <laughs> uh, then here, uh, so Tyeth is saying or asking and commenting, unlimited devices for broadcast mode. Uh, this is when we were talking about that new, yeah. new features coming out. Um, except won't won't each receiver, or sorry, except won't each receiver impede those behind it? No, not at all. Um, there are actually two ways that devices can receive um, broadcast uh, transmissions. There's a um, process called active scanning, and that can inv involve two-way communication with those receiving devices, actually generating some radio traffic as well. But in pure broadcast, the receiving devices are only receiving. They do not generate any traffic whatsoever. If you're talking about physical impedance, it must be some point at which um, you know, a squillion devices with a certain thickness and density will impede them. But um, in terms of radio spectrum availability, it's completely scalable. And uh, you know, any number of devices in a room uh, will concurrently receive the, the broadcast signal from uh, the single transmitting device. Excellent. There you go. I hope that answers your question there, Ty. I'm looking for any more here. It looks like they've started their own little conversation there but this one came up from david w and it wouldn't be david w if he didn't bring in autonomous automotive so uh where were where or is there a role for bluetooth in the autonomous vehicle space or autonomous robots i i, I want to just get say this real quick i think like everywhere uh, i feel like you could have uh, uh, all sorts of bluetooth applications with autonomous robots and, and vehicles but martin let's get your your input on this Oh, uh, well, two levels to this answer. I'm going to start by saying I have no idea. There you go. <laughs> Don't know anything about autonomous robots. Um, um, the dog bot over there is, is sadly not autonomous um, or, or cars. But um, yeah, I would imagine there's a great deal of potential there. I'm going to have to guess a little bit here, but I would imagine autonomy requires um, data relating to the external environment and therefore sensors. And uh, Bluetooth is very good at allowing data from sensors to be communicated to other devices wirelessly. So sounds like there's probably a big role for uh, a low power consuming wireless technology like Bluetooth there, but specifics I can't give you, I'm afraid. The first thing that comes to mind for me, at least what I would, what, what I think would be awesome mm -hmm. to see is kind of like the Power Rangers robot, right? Like where they're detachable arms, detachable legs, the head, they're all different. They're all, all the different uh, Power Rangers each have a different component of this huge robot. So I think that would be pretty cool if, you know, okay, they're connected while they're connected, no Bluetooth, and then all of a sudden they yeah. attach and you have five different robots all kind of communicating with each other in this <clears> mesh, <throat> making sure, trying to perform a, a single task. Each it's a lovely function. thought. I, I think I'm going to have nightmares tonight though about headless robots. <laughs> so, uh, so thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, let's build it, David. Um, all right, cool. Um, I, I think it's demo time. We don't have a little splash screen or interesting uh, segment introduction for that so mm -hmm. demo time martin i think uh first of all before we dive into these demos um i i don't know if you want to explain all five at the beginning it might be worth it to just explain one at a time give a give a high view of what the demo is and what you're going to show and then and then dive into it so we at least kind of know what we're going into each time yeah sure so i'm actually going to start with um i mean actually i just need to tell you something i should have said earlier on robert um you know you, you did announce i was going to do five live demos but um 
when all this was uh, publicized on social media, there was a bit of a backlash. Uh, a lot of people were saying five live demos is, is a really stupid thing to do. I mean, he's going to make a fool of himself. It's not going to work. Is he crazy? And, you know, they're probably right. And I reflected upon this and um, I'm not going to do five live demos. But I'm going to do six. <laughs> six demos, the, six demos. What's the worst that's going to happen? I could make a fool of myself, but I can do that without demos. No problem at all. And, you know, it's not as if this is being recorded or that the internet never forget. <laughs> My humiliation will be out there forever. So, yeah, whatever. I'm going to do six. Um, I'm going to start with two that I consider to be um, the basics. Um, this um, It's all about data transfer between two devices, point-to-point -point communication between two devices. And I kind of break these things into two broad use cases, rightly or wrongly. The first I call monitoring things. This is really about um, kind of keeping an eye on the state of another device or system or environment. It involves sensors. Um, and the other one I call controlling things. So that's demos number one and two. So I'm going to start with monitoring things. And I'm going to use a BBC microbit, this one here. Uh, the microbit has an accelerometer sensor inside it. So it measures acceleration in three dimensions. My Android smartphone is the other device, and it's going to discover the microbit, which is currently sat there doing something called advertising. It's broadcasting small packets so it can be found by my application, which will scan and discover it. It's then going to connect, and my app's going to say to the microbit, which is running something called the accelerometer service, could I please have accelerometer data? And it's then going to stream over the wireless connection to the app, and you'll see X, Y, and Z measurements for acceleration in the three dimensions in 3D space uh, on screen, or at least that's the theory. Let's see if the dark angels of demos are here or not. So if you're a smartphone developer, by the way, just watch what happens here because the sequence of events is really common. I'm mirroring my phone on the screen of my PC so you can see it easily. I'm going to hit the Find Devices button. That causes my app to scan. Bang, it's discovered the BBC Microbit. You can see it listed there. When I select it, my app will request a connection. You should see a letter C appear on the uh, Microbit screen to indicate that connection. And then you'll see the data streaming in. Whoops, that's the wrong button. Let's try that button. There we go. I've got my letter C. You can see lines appearing on the screen. Not very interesting. But if I pick up the Microbit and its little battery here, you can see now evidence of acceleration in 3D space. And if I go side to side, you can see it's the X direction at the top there, forwards and backwards. It's Y in the middle there and up and down. It's the Z dimension at the bottom of the screen there in blue. So that is monitoring things, acquiring data from sensors in real time. I'm going to put the microbit out of the way there and move on to demo number two. Demo number two also involves connection-oriented communication. This is controlling things. If I can make sure you can see stuff. Here's Dogbot. Hope you can see it well enough in this dodgy lighting. Dogbot is a kit. It's a thing called a Gigglebot. It comes with a chassis and some motors underneath and some wheels um, and a slot into which you can uh, plug a BBC microbit. Um, it's electrically uh, connected to the motors for the wheels. I've added connections to a couple of servos and some LEDs at the front for the dog's scary looking red eyes. Now, I'm going to keep hold of dog bots because I don't want him to you know, run off around the room and uh, cause trouble. I'm going to fire up another application. Looks suspiciously similar to the last one. And I'm going to hit find devices. And there we go. It's discovered it straight away. I'm going to connect to it. Now, this time, let me just move my mirrored screen over so you can see it. This time the microbit's running something called the event service. And I'm going to write data to one of its characteristics. That's a fancy name for a data item. It's called client event. It means something happened on the client device. That's my smartphone app. And depending on what I do on the user interface, the value I write to the remote device's data item will vary. And in the code on the microbit, I've basically got a big switch statement that looks at that value and then uses hardware APIs to control what happens next. So basic things I might want to do are, let's see if I can show you the wheels, drive the thing, 
Oh, hang on. This is upside down for me. Let me turn that around so I can see what I'm doing. There we go. That was a scary moment. Oh, no, my demo is not working. <laughs> I can go backwards as well. I can steer it as well, but that requires me to use two buttons at once, which is beyond my uh, dexterity with one hand. Um, I can do things like switch the, the eyes on. So I'm sending data across my Bluetooth connection here, switch them off, switch them on. I can do things like make it shake its head. That's the servos going there. And if we watch the tail at the back, don't know how easy it is to see this. It wags its tail. There you go. Happy dog, friendly dog, or possibly scary evil robot dog that's pretending to be a happy, friendly dog. Who knows? It's the robot find rising. We've got to be careful. Don't trust them. I'd find a way to scare my wife with it somehow. <laughs> Can you imagine that thing with the eyes lit showing up by the side of your bed in the middle of the night? Oh, yeah. She won't want to go to the, the bathroom in the middle of the night ever again. <laughs> so listen, I want to put the audience at some stuff as we progress through the demos because we have a really nice collection of resources at our website, Bluetooth.com, of course. If you go into resources and click on study guides, study guide is the term we use for Resources that are designed for developers to learn. And they cover some of the theory, but they're very hands-on. There's always a hands-on development project for you to do as well. We've got a whole collection of them. The one you need to look at if you're interested in smartphone application developments or the microcontroller side, the peripheral side, where you're dealing with connection-oriented scenarios like that, you need this one, an introduction to Bluetooth low energy development. It's actually great fun. You build a project, it's a bit of hardware to muck around with as well. Um, some Zephyr in there, some Raspberry Pi, iOS, Android, everything is in there. And as I say, hands-on projects with solutions to get the code as well. So Martin, real quick, real quick here, and thank you for sharing that resource. We did post it in the chat there. Can, can you just, going back to demo one, since before we get to, we still got four more to go. Um, could you tell us what chipsets are in each of these devices when, when we go into this? Um, like what, what, what are the yeah. chips that were being used in, um, I mean, we had the micro bit. And then now we have yeah, sure. uh, the, 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 the doggo bot. Yeah, so they were both BBC microbits. And in there you've got um, a Nordic Semiconductors NRF51 Bluetooth module. And that has an ARM Cortex M0, I think, in, think inside it. Yeah, it, it actually, yeah, it looks like the NRF51822 uh, um, with, yeah. yes, a Cortex, a Cortex M0. There you go. Cool, thank you. Yeah, remind me if I forget to do that. Um, so next up, I'm going to sort of shift topics now. Um, so we've done two kind of connection-oriented scenarios. I want to talk about Bluetooth Mesh next. Um, I'm not sure that that many people still know about Bluetooth Mesh. It's a fairly niche topic for smart buildings and stuff like that. So I'm going to show you um, Bluetooth Mesh from three different perspectives. Devices in involved here. First of all, no, no, no surprise, the 16... Nordic thingies I've got here are all, all um, what we call nodes in a Bluetooth mesh network. Now I've actually got 20 nodes in this network. I'll try and remember to kind of enumerate them so you know where they all are. Now, running on the Nordic thingies, I've got the Zephyr open source operating system. That gives me my uh, mesh stack. Great support for Bluetooth uh, on Zephyr, as I said before. Device behaviors, in the context of Bluetooth Mesh are defined in terms of things called models. So a model defines a collection of tightly related, very focused behaviors, such as the ability to switch a device on or off or change the level of something. We have a whole specification dedicated to Bluetooth models. Now, you have to implement the models because this is where you interface with hardware and decide exactly what it is that you want to do. So you have to write code to implement models. So on these devices, I've implemented three different models. I've got something called the generic on-off server model that lets me switch devices on or off. And in this case, what I'm looking to do is control the LEDs that each of these uh, independent Nordic thingies have. So generic on-off server model, and yes, there are servers. They have state like on or off. There are also client models. I'll come on to that in a moment. I've also implemented something called the light HSL server model. HSL is hue, saturation, and lightness. That's a color representation scheme. That's there so I can change the color of the LEDs. 
And I've also implemented on every device, although it's only actively kind of in use on two of them, something called the sensor server model, very generalized model for handling any type of sensor, multiple sensors concurrently and broadcasting sensor measurements periodically. So that's the code that's on all those things. Now, each one of my mesh devices has been through a process we call provisioning and configuration. Provisioning is a bit like pairing with pairs of connectable Bluetooth devices. It's really a security procedure. They've all been equipped with unique keys, a network key and an application key. And that's what makes my devices members of my network and secure. Um, lots of things you can do to configure devices without changing the code and things like this. Uh, let me show you one important aspect of the configuration. So there's my, uh, my grid of um, 16 uh, Bluetooth mesh nodes. There's no concept of a grid or rows and columns in Bluetooth mesh itself. But mesh devices, mesh nodes all have a unique 16-bit address. That's called a unicast address. However, we hardly ever use it. Um, we use it when we're configuring an individual device. That's the only time that I can think of where we use that unique device address. The rest of the time we use what are called group addresses and we have a publish and subscribe system that's part of Bluetooth Mesh. So every device that you can see there has been subscribed to, and I'll explain that in a moment, address C001. Now, subscribing means I've told that device it has to be interested in any messages that it sees in the network that have a destination address of C001. So if it understands the message type, it'll say C001. Oh, yeah, I care about that. I'm going to process that message. It's subscribed to that destination address. I've also used distinct addresses for each row and each column. So each device kind of knows which row and which column it's in. Now, most of the time in a mesh network, say in a smart building, we've got microcontroller based devices talking to each other and they're each a fully blown uh, uh, mesh device with a full mesh uh, stack on them. So maybe when I walk into the office in the morning, big open plan office, big row of lights over all the desks, there's a switch panel on the wall, but it's not wired. It's wireless. It's a Bluetooth mesh node, in fact, in the network. And to replicate that, I'm using the Nordic developer board down here. Um, it's got four buttons. I actually programmed this device. It's running mesh, uh, sorry, Zephyr again. This is running uh, models I've implemented, this time the generic on-off client model and the light HSL client model. So the clients that matches the servers on the, uh, the thingies. So if I press button one, what it's gonna do is send a special message type that relates to the generic on-off server model. It's called generic on-off set unacknowledged. That's the full message type name. And I'm going to send it to address C001 that they've all been subscribed to. So they should, should all care about this with a value of one, which means on. So let me see what happens when I press button one. Absolutely nothing. What has happened there? Let me just reset this device. No. I'm afraid, yes. <laughs> We were we were two for two. It's okay. Let's uh, let let let's see. I mean, oh, again, in case something funny's happened here. No, that is really really disturbing. Oh, my battery's flat. What could it mean? Oh, not maybe, that. maybe the batteries ran out. It is possible. I thought I'd charge them up. Oh, there's some power there. Oh, that's very odd. I tell you what, we'll soldier on though. Don't know what's going on there. My humiliation um, is complete. <laughs> Demo <laughs> News flash, Demo God, strike again. We go like this. It was like this. working before we came on the air. Let's try instead demo number two. See if this works. I'll explain what I'm doing in a moment. So I've got a smartphone app here. Let's fire this one up. And um, if this doesn't work, then there's something wrong with my thingy nodes, um, low battery or something horrible like that. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, there we go. There's, there's something wrong with, we found the culprit with this, this board. I'm not sure what's it, going on there. It um, could be something as simple as the cable too. I mean, 
you know, those USB, uh, those USB, uh, uh, micro USB or mini USBs, they break all the time. I feel like I actually can't see any sign of power on that board. So that, that could actually be the issue. But anyway, yeah. we're going to pretend that didn't happen. Um, okay. And I'll do all the same stuff, but using a smartphone. So normally it's microcontroller based product with a full mesh stack to other similar devices, um, taking care of communication in the network. But every now and again, we need a graphical user interface and lots of devices can provide such things. But most devices out there that can do GUIs don't have a mesh stack on them. The only exception I can think of is Linux. Linux has pretty good support for Bluetooth mesh today, but Android, iOS, and so on, they do not. Smart buildings have teams of people called building management. They want to wander around the building and do things with the entire network. So it's a special role that a Bluetooth mesh device can assume called the proxy. It's like a P on that one there. So I didn't forget which one it was. And proxy uh, node essentially has two Bluetooth stacks on it. It has the layers of the stack required to handle the connection oriented stuff we saw in the first two demos, as well as a full Bluetooth mesh stack. And an application like a smartphone app can formulate mesh messages, wrap them in something called the proxy protocol, write them over the connection, and the proxy will unwrap those PDUs and relay them into the network. So the net effect of that is I can use things like in-market, smartphones, tablets, PCs, you name it, to control my mesh network. And you've already seen the first successful test. Um, the UI, just to explain it further, the top part lets me select destination addresses. You can see all is currently um, selected. Uh, and the bottom half lets me choose message types. So if I change the destination address to C23, that's column three, and select the light HSL message to change it to red. There you go, only the red, uh, only column three responded. That's the publish and subscribe stuff in action. I select row three, send a green request. You see just that row change. So that's working nicely. Martin, real quick, I just have a quick question on this one. So, so when you talk about the proxy node, yeah. um, is this kind of like, the node that you, so you're communicating with that node and then that node is broadcasting it to the rest of the mesh completely correct yes yeah. so the node that has the proxy role in many ways is just like the micro bit was in the first two demos it uh, it advertises uh, in such a way that it says i'm a proxy uh, it allows me to connect to it and then i'm kind of pushing mesh, mesh messages in this special format down that connection down that pipe to the proxy and it then broadcasts, it relays those uh, received messages to the rest of the network. And so if I wanted to daisy chain, let's just say a bunch of these proxy nodes and then branch off from these proxy nodes, that's is that, that that's a thing? It's not, but I'm glad you asked actually, because one of the um, other roles that a Bluetooth mesh node of any sort can assume is called the relay. Because obviously, you know, buildings are big, wireless communication always has a limited range depending on physical barriers, barriers and stuff like this. So any device, these are not special networking devices because it's just software. Any device can also assume the role of relay and it will simply repeat any message that it sees so that it bounces across the network to reach its destination. So very nice. A Bluetooth mesh network can be enormous and cover a very, very wide area. Gotcha. A cool. of that. Yeah, good very question. Cool. So my last mesh demo, and I trust the angels or gods or whatever they are are going to be kind to me this time, <laughs> um, kind of concerns the question, okay, um, actually I'll tell you what, I'm going to just uh, switch that back to the same color. Um, am I connected? No, not. Um, what if I want to control my smart building's mesh network from over the internet. What if I want to do that? And there we go, Let's reset everything. Which is actually quite a common requirement actually in the world of smart buildings, people want to do that stuff. Now, there are no standards governing everything that you need here. So you kind of need to get a bit creative. Um, and what you need is something called a gateway, a Bluetooth internet gateway. So we have a study guide, actually, I'm going to point you out in a moment that covers the world of gateways. In fact, let me switch over to uh, the website, first of all, before I go too far. Study guide for mesh development, 
right there on the screen, Introduction to Bluetooth Mesh Software Development. You can build something like what you just saw. Don't need as many devices, two is enough. The one for the mesh proxy function, that's where you kind of learn how to do the proxy stuff with smartphones and other devices and inject messages over a connection. We do also have something for Bluetooth internet gateways. So it's here and you can create exactly what I'm about to show you uh, in a moment. <clears throat> Architecturally, um, I've got my gateway actually running on a Raspberry Pi 400 that you can't see. It's um, a bit too big to fit in this small demo space. It's behind my monitor there but it's running a web server. Um, the web server allows me to express Bluetooth mesh operations, message types over HTTP using JSON objects and stuff like that. Um, I've written a load of code and used the BlueZ Bluetooth mesh stack to turn that into mesh messages and interactions with the rest of the network. So my gateway receives requests over HTTP, turns them into mesh messages, Mesh messages coming out of the network come back to me and they get delivered over web sockets back to the HTTP client. Now, I told you there were 20 nodes in this entire network. We've got 16 thingies. We've got 17 in that the malfunctioning uh, dev board there that was meant to my, my switch is also a node. My smartphone application was also provisioned. It has the keys. So it's provisioned out of band. That's 18. My Gateway actually has two distinct processes running on it, each of which is provisioned as a separate node. One handles the internet to mesh net network path, kind of sending messages into the network, and the other handles the mesh network to internet path. They are logically separate nodes that have each been individually, individually provisioned. Um, and that may or may not give, that probably gives us 19. There's, there's another one I've not told you about yet. So that's roughly speaking the architecture, and you can learn all about that in the study guide. So let's see if I can be brave and fire my browser up and try to arrange things so you can actually see. Let's do that. Let's just drag that out of the way over there. So here we go. Um, this is just a web application loaded from an Apache web server. Um, I've got a, got a webcam plugged into it. So we get yet another view. There we are, same view. There's my hand. It's live, honestly. Um, and the first thing you're going to see is all the same kind of stuff. So I've got a destination address selector here, and I can switch things on or off, and I can choose colors. Um, let's just switch everything on now. There you go. So it's actually the gateway node, the Raspberry Pi, that sent those mesh messages on behalf of the web browser. <clears throat> Excuse me, the web application. I can change colors. I can do publish and subscribe and all that stuff. But I can also subscribe to receive sensor messages, which I haven't really touched upon yet. All of these devices implement the sensor server model, but only those which have had a publish address configured within them are actively sampling the temperature. And periodically, I think it's every five seconds, maybe every 10, publishing or broadcasting a message which has sensor temperature readings in it. That one, with the orange blob is measuring the indoor temperature. So if I click here, that will subscribe my gateway to receiving those messages and they should be sent over a WebSocket connection to my uh, web application here. In fact, there's the first reading in, it says it's 23 degrees. I've got a bunch of um, SSH sessions running here as well. So this is the, um, that's actually the gateway. So we're seeing WebSocket stuff and uh, Apache web server stuff going on there. Um, if I subscribe to the other one, the outdoor temperature, my final 20th node is actually outside on the windowsill of my little home office here. And it should be, I would imagine, a little bit colder. Let's see what uh, the temperature is out there today. Seven and a half degrees Celsius. Apologies oh my goodness. To the Americans, but I, I learned this week that if you um, double the Celsius value and add 30, you get a, approximately the Fahrenheit equivalent. Yeah, it's actually 1.8. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm just I, yeah, I mean, that, that's actually a, it's a, it's a formula. Instead of double, really point, right, thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. too hard for me. Um, yeah, I'm doubling it. This, I might be able to persuade the indoor temperature to go up. 
Yeah, just just so everyone does know, I did calculate these already, though. So it's uh, indoor temperature. Oh, there you go. It went up. There you go. So that, that's, that's yeah. in real time. Yeah, that's uh, temperature sensor there. So three mesh scenarios, study guides for all of them, um, direct mesh communication via a proxy and a smartphone, uh, Bluetooth <laughs> internet gateway. We've got resources for all those things. That takes me on to my final uh, demonstration, which actually relies on this um, dubious USB cable. So I hope this works as well. Um, let me just organize a couple of things here. I'm going to have to unplug that one. This is really cool, by the way, Martin. I, I, just, I think it's awesome. I was looking up, Thank by you. the way, the, these these little Nordic thingies. Uh, they're, they're not cheap. They're like a hundred and something bucks a pop. And it might just be because of the supply chain chip shortages right now. But I mean, you know, uh, you got maybe, you got, a nice, yeah, much, um, you got a nice little retirement fund on your desk. I've got a lot of good <laughs> stuff here. This is true. Um, so some slight trepidation here about whether the uh, USB cable is going to let me down, although I have got others I could grab, but I don't waste too much time. <clears throat> what I'm going to try and show you here Again, it takes a bit of organization of windows, so this is visible. Um, let, me, let me move that a little bit higher up. Maybe move that a little bit. <clears throat> it's this. So these mystery devices, uh, this is actually a demonstrator from a company called Ublocks. You can see the name on that device. What this is going to allow me to show you is asset tracking. So that's a, a specific application of a relatively new Bluetooth capability called direction finding. This kind of came out in... Um, version 5.1 of the core spec uh, a couple of years ago, excuse me, drying up a bit here. Um, and what this lets you do is calculate quite accurately the direction from which a received signal was transmitted. And you can do this relative to a horizontal plane that's called the azimuth, vertical plane that's called the elevation. You can do it with multiple signals, do trial iteration, turn that into a very precise location, uh, you know, to within a few centimeters, uh, which makes it great for asset tracking. So two ways of doing this, one's called angle of arrival. The other method is called angle of departure. And the key thing here is that the receiving device, receiving this special direction finding signal, which by the way, is a standard Bluetooth packet with some extra stuff on the end called the constant tone extension, CTE. The device doing the receiving does all the calculations to figure out which direction the signal is coming from. But in the architecture, depending on the method you're using, one of those devices, the transmitter or the deceiver, has a single antenna, as would normally be the case. The other has an antenna array, so multiple ant antenna. So we're using the angle of arrival method here. <clears throat> this is basically a beacon. It's transmitting. Bluetooth packets with that CTE stuff on the end. It's got a single antenna. This other device is acting as what we call a locator. It's got an antenna array. And what it's doing is calculating two angles relative to the horizontal plane, the azimuth, and vertical, the elevation, and some signal strengths for both those values, and hopefully sending them over a serial connection via this questionable USB cable to my laptop where we'll see it on screen on my demo. What I've done is I've written a straightforward web application. It's HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, but I'm using the web serial APIs for the first time, by the way. Barely know what I'm doing, but I did get something working quite nicely, apart from one glitch, which I'm fairly sure we'll see. So let me see if I can connect to that USB port. And that's the glitch, let's try that again. And there you go. So what's happening now, I show the developer console, there you go, you can see values being sent by the locator device over the serial connection into my PC where the web serial API is picking stuff up and showing it on screen there. So let's close that down. Now if I pick up the beacon, and by the way, I'm showing this demo in the worst possible physical circumstances, way too close for the best possible behavior, but watch the azimuth indicator the way that moves around as I move around. And now as I go up and around, look at the way the elevation changes. These things work best when you're about two meters away or more. Close up is a bit harder to do because of reflections and things, but you get the idea. This is a pretty neat 
application of Bluetooth in the world of location-based services. So that's the first time I've got my hands on a um, kit like that. I know other uh, companies are about to launch uh, similar Bluetooth direction finding um, stuff. So that actually was my final demo. You know, I think five out of six wasn't bad. If I no, was really good, really good. Tripped up by a dodgy battery or something, you know, I think, I think we'll, uh, we'll let that one go. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, I, I, I want to just talk about this demo real quick because so there was, there's one of our arm innovators named Kitty Young and um, she came on the show one time to talk about uh, she does uh, um, like technology infused <clears throat> fashion wear. Right. So, oh, wow. so um, one of the things she made was this little brooch clip thing that a mother and, and kid would wear or a, a parent and a kid would wear. And yeah. uh, so the mom wears the mom or, or kid wears a, um, a uh, uh, the brooch. And then, as the kid gets further, I believe it starts to vibrate or beep. Now, oh. this is amazing because I can already picture, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to possibly put one of these little trackers in your kid when you go to Disneyland. And then you could be the one with the hub in your backpack that's connected to an application on your phone that gives you real directional information about literally a compass that shows you where your kid is. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, that would be really, really cool. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people would uh, find that very uh, reassuring. Yeah, yeah. I, I, mean, I have kids too; they're a bit older than uh, than that now, but uh, I, I can relate. Can you? Can you? I, I guess I'm. I guess I'm trying to see like maybe where the future of these types of uh, you know these uh, antenna arrays may end up. Can you yeah. see these types of arrays ending up in cell phones at some point, where we have these multiple antennas on? We wouldn't know where they are in the phone, but for this type of directional information natively oh, inside the maybe. hardware of the phone i think more, more likely actually is um we'll, there's sort of a number of primary use cases we we envisage for this stuff and some of them are better suited to the angle of arrival method that you just saw some gotcha. of them are better suited to the angle of departure so indoor navigation knowing where you are very smartphone centric idea that one will use um the angle of departure method where there's some kind of beacon type thing um, on the ceiling of the airport, you know, there are a bunch yeah. of these things all over the place. It's got the antenna array, <clears throat> but the, um, you know, thousands of people uh, rushing to connect, their, to catch their flights, they'll know exactly where they are because direction finding information is beaming, you know, being beamed straight to their gotcha. phones and the calculations taking place there. Um, yeah, asset tracking, whether the asset is a human being that you kind of value or um, a thing in a factory. Um, that's more likely to use the the angle of arrival thing that we just saw. Excellent, excellent. So, um, Martin, we're we're at the top of the hour. You know, I, I want to be respectful, of course, of your time and the time of our viewers here. I might sure. make a post. You know, everyone, thank you so much for spending these extra few minutes with us. And uh, and uh, you know, I I see one last question in here. Maybe we can take it. I feel like this might have been answered, but does it require more than one receiver to get direction, not just distance? Um, I think. Uh, I think that, that the comes answer is no. Um, so you only need one receiver for direction information. You may need two for position. Okay. And then uh, we need to offer RFID equivalent asset tracking and locating. So do customer phones already have multiple Bluetooth antennas required to get direction? And this was the question I just asked and Tyeth just yeah. kind of clarified that we got that. That's right. Uh, so the answer is no, uh, they don't currently have, um, have that. Oh, interestingly. Hey, I can hey! see it. Six out of six. We have a power problem. We have a power problem, people. And look, we can now switch them on and off. We can switch them on. I can cycle through the colors. I was not defeated by the dark angel it. of demos. <laughs> yes, good job, Martin. No, yeah, uh, that's six out of six. We need to change that banner, uh, uh, Seb. Um, getting that six out of six. So, oh, so defeated. Yeah, <laughs> Martin, we have the we have the last uh, last thing here, uh, which is uh, our uh, weekly shameless plug. So this goes to you for anything you'd like to plug here. We have some links, I believe, you provided with uh, for us. So uh, yeah. go ahead, take it away. Without or, question, or it's it's the study guides. Um, honestly, these are our primary resources. Most recent release, by the way, which um, I worked on for a few months, is a study guide for Linux developers. Linux uses Blue Z. That's the stack. It is a fact that some people find it difficult to, to, to learn about. So um, it's a bit of a learning curve. So this one takes you through the whole thing right from scratch. And I hope, and I've had some good feedback already, makes developing Bluetooth on Linux much, much easier. So feast your eyes on our study guides 
find the one that's right for you and your learning goals and, and, and go have fun because they're all full of uh, kind of cool projects that uh, I think are really enjoyable. That is great. So, yeah. um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm stoked. And then of course, uh, you know, don't forget to go check out Martin's uh, go music. Check out my, my terrible yeah. music. That's right. Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> After we hang up here, I'm going to be literally cruising to your YouTube channel and checking those out. So well, I apologize in advance. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. So Martin, you know, I want to just thank you very much again for taking the time to be with us here. Uh, I know your time is very valuable. So, uh, you know, I hope not you enjoyed all. it. Hope you had fun. We had fun. You I did, had fun. You. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so real quick, I'm just going to close this out. Uh, everyone, you know, you know, the, you know, the drill here. So, you know, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll be back next week. We have one of our arm innovators, Ajit Reina from Redis Labs, who will be showcasing a really cool robot that he built. In fact, it's a drone that detects fires. Now it can have a bunch of other use cases. That's Ajit nice. will, of course, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Of course, Ajit has some demos, a nice presentation for us, and uh, we'll get to see that next week. So don't miss that. If you enjoyed the video, I mean it, please hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe to the Arm Software Dev YouTube channel, the channel that you are watching this on right now. We go live every Thursday, 5 p.m., along with all sorts of other cool content that we provide to you through this YouTube channel. Once again, everyone, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful week, a wonderful weekend. Martin, you as well. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll be pinging you on that bike. I might, I might need some advice on, on a bicycle. No problem. <laughs> All right. Y'all take care. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yep. Bye, everyone. Right.